The world is a beautiful but challenging place to live. And let's face it, life hits hard sometimes. So if you find your hopes and dreams and mental well-being needs a boost, you're tuned in to the right podcast. Welcome to Inspire Us with your host, Jay Paul Nadeau, a former hostage negotiator turned motivational speaker and acclaimed author of Take Control of Your Life. And now, here's your host, Jay Paul Nadeau. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of Inspire Us. Today, I have a guest who uses storytelling and improvisation to give a voice to so many people who otherwise would have kept their voice silent. Naomi Tesler has been working with communities globally for nine years, using theater to inspire positive change. She's a graduate of the Masters of Arts program in educational theater for colleges and communities, New York University, and currently facilitates and develops branch out theater workshops and productions with organizations and groups in Toronto and Ottawa. Now, this woman is quite remarkable. There's a point in our conversation where I got choked up. She is so passionate about using theater as a tool for encouraging self empowerment, self-confidence, environmental awareness, social justice, and well-being is fascinating. And as a facilitator, Naomi has an extensive background in theater of the oppressed, playback theater, acting, physical theater, storytelling, directing, and playwriting, and she strives to share these tools with those she works with and collaborates with. In addition to being a dynamic workshop facilitator and educator, Naomi also works as an actor, director, playwright, poet, singer, and Reiki master. How's that? You're in for a treat, folks. She believes in uniting communities through theater to build bridges and break through barriers. And I could go on and on about her, but wait until you hear her firsthand. She's very inspirational. And so, without any further delay, here is Naomi Tesler. Hello, Naomi. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic. Welcome to Inspire Us. I'm so happy to have you on. I've been reading your bio. I had a chat with you the other day, uh, and I was talking to Rachel, and she had so many nice things to say about you. So I am I'm ecstatic to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. I'm honored to be here and inspired by your journey as well and all that you're sharing with the world. Well, you know what? I think we're talking the same language here because we talk inspiration and that's what we're out to do because everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs inspiration. It just seems that 2020 has magnified that for everyone because a lot of people have lost hope and a lot of people have become disconnected in, in one form or another, be it with friends and, and relatives, or be it with their work or their practices and, and their joys. So let's try to bring a little inspiration into their lives. And I know I'm talking to the right person because you have a theater and uh, workshops all based around the development of uh, self-empowerment, self-confidence, environmental awareness, social justice, and well-being. Everybody has a story. Naomi, I've been talking too much. I'm going to turn it over to you. What's your story? How did you get into this? Oh, that is a wonderful question. So my journey actually began when I was five, when I was a little girl. And I was shy. And I was asked to play Snow White in my kindergarten play. And this was a big leap for me because being someone who hid behind my mom's leg, uh, I, I was quite, you know, daunted by the idea of being front center, taking the lead in this show. But my teachers saw something in me that planted a seed that has really shaped the rest of my path. They saw something in me that could bring words, music, 
movement to life on stage. And that creative practice really helped me build my own confidence, helped me find my voice and a sense of empowerment. And I remember that story every time I'm working with a participant who is shy, who says, I'm here to watch. I don't really want to participate. This is not really my thing. <laughs> And I think about myself, my inner child, that little, little Naomi who was so shy, who got on stage and found her, her full self. And so that's the gift that I love to share with people. So that was the beginning. And then, uh, you know, I, I had many different interests and different ideas as to what I wanted to do with um, my future when I was studying in university. I was actually studying English literature and theater on the side. And then I discovered the work. I learned about the work of Augusto Boal, who is the founder and creator of Theater of the Oppressed. And that has become my one of my main modalities in the work that I lead and co-create and branch out theater. And when I learned about that work, I just wanted to learn more and, and see shows that were in that style, which is known as forum theater. And I also learned of the style called playback theater, which is another one of my main modalities. And both these practices invite people to share their stories of lived experience of oppression or joy or whatever ups and downs they may be having. And with theater of the oppressed work, it's about looking at these experiences and identifying how to transform them, how to rehearse for change. With playback theater, it's about inviting uh, folks to tell their stories and watch the actors reenact them on stage, sharing universality and connection through story, building a, a shared understanding and a space of openness and togetherness. So for me, when I learned about those practices, I felt like I, I found my hook. I found my, my vision for the next steps and just kept learning and growing in those areas to take me to create Branch Out Theater in 2010. Well, that is a remarkable story. And it's amazing. Theater draws people together, a certain community of people together. We all know that. Uh, I myself love the theater. Uh, my youngest daughter, when she was three or four, she was already acting and singing. And uh, she followed a path very similar to yours. She became an actress and a singer. And I spent a lot of time at the theater. And I know the power that theater has. It entertains, it educates, it, it gives us a, a feeling. You know, we leave having heard a story. Now, what you were talking about, this uh, theater of the oppressed, and uh, I think I wrote down the forum theater and the playback theater. All these have a common theme, is that correct? Just getting your personal stories out. Let me ask you, are you the one who writes the plays for the, for the actors and actresses, the people who are shy? Are you the one who helps them act this out? What do you, what's your role? It's a great question. So I work in, a various, in various ways. So when I work with groups, and we work together for longer term projects. For example, right now I'm working with seniors in Toronto and we worked together actually already for a few years. It's a really special group. And we co-created a play addressing elder abuse uh, about a year and a half ago. And now we're in the process of co-creating a new play on the same theme, looking at what's happening right now with COVID and how seniors are being impacted and how isolation is, you know, really taking a toll on their lives. Mm -hmm. So with them and with, with other groups that I work with on a longer term basis, the process is completely collaborative. The invitation is for the participants to share their stories of lived experiences or stories, uh, for example, for these seniors, they're sharing stories about their own friends, maybe family members as well. Uh, based on their experiences and drawing from what everyone is sharing, we then begin to improvise scenes. Mm. And from their improvisations, I'm taking notes. And so trying to get all their words down because my hope is always to empower the participants to be the ones to write 
to play when I'm working with a group, uh, to have their full stories, their voices shared, their ideas staged. And then whatever I've taken notes on, we then collectively review, and then we work together to decide what stays in the script, what goes, and how it's gonna all be orchestrated, what the order will be. And so every step of the way, it's a, it's a collaborative process. And then when we get into rehearsal mode, we still might find, oh, you know, this doesn't work with the script. Let's change this or let's add that to really make it as, as impactful and as true to what they're hoping to achieve as possible. So that's, that's been the process. Uh, with uh, other, other instances, I've also been commissioned to write forum theater plays for different organizations, schools or universities addressing specific issues that are prevalent uh, for them. So in those instances, sometimes I might get research uh, that I, I you know, look through and transcribe into a play. Other instances, I might just be having you know, a, a talk with a professor or a teacher or someone who's ahead of an organization telling me about the issues that they're having. And so it's still a collaborative process, whereas from that discussion or that research, I will, I will draft something together, send it back to the person who has commissioned the work for their feedback. And it's a, you know, a back and forth until the script really feels like it's capturing the essence of the issues that they're trying to address. Because I always see clients or participants I work with as they're the experts on their lived experience. They're the experts on the issues that they're trying to address. I come in as the expert on the tools that I work with and how to stage it, how to make it, um, you know, translate into theater. And when I work with participants, my role is also to, to direct them in the rehearsal process and to teach them how to improvise because with forum theater specifically, improvisation is a huge part of the practice because, uh, Forum theater is essentially a worst case scenario play in that our project performers, our ensemble that is, or our actors if we're doing a commissioned performance, they'll perform the play twice. The first time the audience gets to see the worst case scenario. The second time the audience gets to go from being passive spectators to active spec actors to intervene in the action of the play and to rehearse how to create change. So actors that I work with, participants I work with, they need to be have some skills in improvisation because you never know what an audience member is going to bring. We can troubleshoot ideas, but essentially the goal is for us not to have all the answers. And that's why we're doing the work is to harvest the answers and ideas for how to create change from the audiences that we're sharing the play with. So that it's a, it's a collaborative process, not only amongst ourselves as the performance troupe, but amongst the audience members in terms of everybody being part of creating the change and, and learning together through this process. What a powerful way of bringing out a message by engaging not only the actors and the actresses, but the audience as well to talk about issues that need to be addressed, examined, uh, dealt with. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're accomplishing by this. I'm wondering at the moment right now, I'm picturing one of your, uh, one of your theater productions and this participation from the actors and the audiences. How, how would you describe the energy from the very beginning of the evening or the afternoon or whenever you're putting it on to the very end? What changes do you see among not only the performers, but the audience members? That's a great question. Well, I would say that with the performers, you know, there, there may be some nervousness <laughs> at the beginning if it's, if it's community participants that I've been working with. Uh, and, you know, even myself as a performer, I, I always... I always have some jitters before I perform, which I feel helps to motivate and propel me, you know, to do to do strong work. Yes. Uh, so I try to embrace those jitters, and and when I'm working with with folks, I you know I try to invite them to share those jitters, and we do some warm ups together to then release them and to bring joy and confidence and to remind each other that we are 
we're working together, we're supporting each other, and we've already come so far in just collaborating to create the play. So we start from that place of positivity, motivating each other, feeling really good and supported. And then I play the role of Joker facilitator in a forum theater play. It's a playback theater show. Uh, the role is called conductor. So also facilitator who's inviting the audience to tell their stories. So my role is to really energize the audience, <laughs> right? To, yeah. to get them excited to be there, to remind them that they're not there as passive audience members, which, you know, when you're seeing any theater show, I would like to think folks are not passive audience members, that they're critically engaged in what they're seeing and hearing and, and taking in. Yet the difference is we really do need folks to be more on their toes and open to sharing stories if it's playback or with forum, ready to jump into the action of our play after they've seen it once through. So at the start of the show, I always, you know, have a really energizing welcome, give an explanation of what they're about to see and try to set a really positive tone. And in my work as a facilitator running workshops, I know I use the word, uh, and I know many facilitators uh, use this, this term rather, not word, of holding space or creating a safe container, mm. which is as the facilitator, it's like I'm giving the whole room a big hug. Right. You know? Making right. them feel embraced by and relaxed by a really positive grounding energy so that they know that uh, they are, even though they're about to see something that's addressing sensitive subject matter, serious issues, that we're all in this together and that they are, they're in a safe space and that uh, there is openness if they, sh should they need extra support, there are folks that can offer that support. Uh, you know, there's been reminding them of some self-care practices like taking a walk, leaving the room, room if they need to. So trying to come from that place of warmth and openness and love, essentially, and compassion when I start a show. And then even though the shows, if it's form theater, it's worst case scenario, for example, uh, there's still, there's still moments of joy and and positivity in the show, you know, that to bring our audience in, to engage them as they get involved in the journey of our characters. And then the ending of the show is, is intentionally heavy. Mm. So when we end the show, you know, there's definitely a sense in the room that everybody's been with us on the journey and feels that heaviness. And so then it's my job again, to reconnect with the audience and the actors, honor and celebrate the actor's work, you know, with applause, uh, and then invite the audience to just name what they're sitting with, name what they've seen, call it Beautiful. out, yeah. call it in. And then I invite them to warm up with us. So they have, they're invited, you know, if they're able to step up, get on their feet, if they are not able to stand, then they can move their body any way that feels comfortable for them. And then we warm ourselves up together, getting them to just walk on the spot, call out their names. I play some little games with them to really warm up their, their brains, to get them ready to make change with us on stage. And then after that warm up, I like, I like to say that folks are ready or more ready than at the start of the show to jump in and create change. And I think I mentioned my role in the form theater is that of a joker. So the right. joker is there like a trickster. Yeah. Try and play with the audience and challenge the audience. And so if nobody says stop, which is the operative word in the second round of form theater for them to jump into the action and create change. If no one says stop, I say stop because I keep reminding folks that we do not want to see the play the same way a second time. Right. So right. So I've had to say stuff several times and, and uh, you know, and, and then we go back and start again. But more often than not, there's always one brave person who's ready to yell stop, who feels so impacted by what they've seen that they want to jump in and make a change. Even if they're not sure what to do, they know that they want to do something. And that's a great starting point, right? To yeah. notice something and to know that it's not okay. And then, then they join us on stage and they get to decide where they want to start from, which actor they want to replace. And then they improvise with the actors and they get to rehearse how to address the issue. 
and they get to go for as long as they feel comfortable on stage and then they get to share with us what change they they created and then the audience is invited i invite the audience to provide feedback so that they can affirm you know what change was made and sometimes challenge or question you know the the intention of the change and uh, then we continue inviting other folks on stage to show us how they would make change because the idea is that there's no one way to do to do it right there's no one way to transform a conflict hmm. there's many ways and there's so much creativity in the audience that we want to encourage all that creativity to come through so that we have many different ideas of how to address the conflicts in each scene. And, I, yeah. Yeah. I think that's remarkable. Sorry, I, I'm cutting in there, but you've well, you please, said, please you said so many great things. Um, you're right. When you are, when you are performing, when you are sharing a story or when something is happening, Never mind if it's on the stage, it could be the stage of life. When something is not right and someone finds a voice to finally stand up and say, stop, that's when great change and great growth can happen. And it takes that courage of that one person. And hopefully that one person ignites the fire within everybody to follow suit and say, we've had enough of this. And we've seen a lot of that in the world uh, recently. Uh, 2020 has certainly brought a lot of stop to uh, what has been going on. So I really love the work that you do. And I love the permission that you actually give the audience upon arriving at the theater to participate, because that's not normally what we go to theater for. There is a fourth wall, the glass wall that people sit behind uh, in their seats and they almost feel guilty for being there because they're going to eavesdrop on somebody else's life, right? And, and I think a lot of theater goers have this, for the first few minutes of the play, they have this like, should I really be here? Looking at this story and, and listening to these people's lives. And then after they get involved in, in the play, it's all right, they're okay. Like it's no longer a play they're watching, it's a story. What you're doing is, remarkable because right from the onset you're saying there is no wall here you know this is this is a community effort to bring about some positive change and i just absolutely love that uh you said that you were working with the elderly and what other kind of groups are you working with naomi to bring this wonderful message about and i can tell you are the perfect hostess for something like this your energy is coming right through the computer this morning your, your <laughs> smile is radiant your i can tell it in your voice Thank you so much. So uh, other branch of theater projects that we are currently leading is uh, are the Creative Well Theater Project. And that's actually an Ottawa-based project. And right now my colleague, Rebecca Benson, is uh, the main facilitator. We've been running this project for this is our sixth year. And we work with adults living with mental illness in Ottawa to address the stigma attached to mental illness and the systemic barriers in the mental health system. And uh, this project has invited folks to take part for, you know, the whole, all six years of the project, we've had some folks that are still with us. Others have joined in, you know, for the past two years or four or five. Some are joining us for the first time as we speak. Uh, and this project has been a remarkable, uh, opportunity to support folks living with mental illness to build their confidence mm -hmm. and their self-esteem and their community and and to really engage their creative capacity. We've had folks who've taken part in the project who have written their own solo shows ah. and uh, this year we're making a change in in our curriculum plan to make space to invite them to share the pieces that they have created with the rest of the group to really honor just the journey that they've been on in, in finding their own theatrical, uh, you know, heightening their own theatrical skill level. Um, but this project as well is, is a project where we do creative form theater play. We use playback theater to share their, invite them to share their stories and their experiences with mental illness. And 
the stigma they've faced. And then every year we have culminated in creating and touring a form theater play. And uh, our many shows have, have toured to different community health centers and community housing sites or other community centers and have really engaged a lot of audience members across Ottawa to join us in, in addressing these issues and thinking about how to be more compassionate, mm. more open to having a dialogue with people who are struggling and understanding what they're going through before they make a judgment, before they discard their resume for a job application or mm -hmm. before, they, before they dismiss them at, at a community center, whatever the situation we've presented in our plays, the rehearsal that we've seen from the audience has really, really inspired a lot of uh, open dialogue to better, better understanding how to support people who are, who are living with mental illness. I think that's a wonderful outreach and a uh, wonderful thing to do because, yeah, we never, we never really know what's going on in somebody else's life. Uh, they have feelings. Everybody has feelings and everybody has their own personal experience. And for some, that experience is much more difficult than it is for others uh, because of um, limitations or because of illnesses. And to feel validated, to feel seen and to feel heard is so important and empowering. It gives you permission to actually find joy or find strength or reach out for it when you really need it. So I think the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. And you're touring to Ottawa. Uh, where else do you work? You work in, in uh, Toronto, uh, Ottawa. Is there anywhere else that you've taken uh, your theater to? Yes, you know what? Um, during the pandemic, we, I had the, uh, I, I just like others, I've had the opportunity to do work online, yeah. which is not something I ever would have imagined uh, doing theater work online. But uh, we, um, in the spring, I thought it would be a really great opportunity to do some playback theater performances, public playback theater shows online to invite folks to talk about their experiences during the pandemic. In this, we did our first show at the end of March. We did end of March, at March, April, and May, we did shows. And that was, you know, we were all in the beginnings, in the unknown, in the thick of that starting point of COVID-19. And that invited uh, global audience members to join mm -hmm. us. And it was such an honor to, uh, to have, have that, uh, experience of welcoming folks from all over the world to to share their stories and to hear the different experiences folks were having based on where they were living and how they were being impacted uh, by the virus and by social distancing or otherwise known as social solidarity right, right. Uh, so so it was uh you know it's been an eye-opening experience to recognize that it's possible to do this kind of work online and uh, it's it's still impactful and we can engage with uh there's no boundaries to who can can attend our show no geographical boundaries right right and COVID-19 has for performers sort of forced us to redefine what an audience is so to us uh and for me I'm I'm a motivational speaker and a keynote speaker and I go in front of an audience there's usually you know several hundred people there and I have that one it's not a one on one but it's one I'm there I'm physically there but as you pointed out now that covid-19 it's we're doing this virtually but it's still very impactful and my question have you thought what is theater going to look like once we are safer to go out and to uh, remingle and to go to productions if that happens sometime soon? But maybe what, so. <laughs> gosh, yeah. Uh, what's it going to look like? 
Well, that's a great question. You know, yeah. I know that uh, there are still performances that are happening in a different way these days where, you know, performances or concerts that are in a giant venue that only have, you know, 50 seating capacity. They only mm -hmm. sell 50 tickets. So uh, it's happening in some respects. My hope is that that we can eventually return to the way theater has been. I, I imagine we'll see more outdoor uh, theater, yes. outdoor venues popping yes. up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, perhaps there will continue, you know, for a while to be smaller audiences, more spaced out audiences. Uh, and, and I do imagine, I, I feel like we're gonna continue to see a hybrid between online offerings and in-person offerings, even once it is safer to safe again to be all together in a theater, I, th I think it's going to continue because we are all of us are discovering how to do it, and these skills are are valid and valuable. And so I think there's going to be, you know, even myself, I, I think about okay, if I'm going to do a playback theater performance in person down the road, I would love to be able to stream it live. And so folks who, who you know, can't make it in person can take part somehow uh, that uh, there's that, that mix of audience members. And I do know there are lots of theater companies, form theater companies that have actually already been doing that. Uh, so, so I think we're, we'll see more of that, just that different options for audiences to, to take part in, in performances. Based well, that, on my reference. that was an excellent answer because I put you on the spot with that one, asking you uh, to tell our audience here, uh, everybody listening, hey, what's the theater going to look like in the future? Talk about putting the spotlight on somebody, but you handled that very, very well. So I applaud okay. you on that one. You're absolutely right, though. I think we are going to see a hybrid uh, um, uh, growth from this because we are finding value in doing what we're doing. You pointed this out a little bit earlier reaching people that otherwise would not have had the opportunity to join you and join your theater group in watching a performance or becoming involved in something. So now you can reach bedridden people. You can reach people from other countries who cannot come, who otherwise, like, and I'm thinking about the disabled people or the people who are, uh, are too weak to get out of their beds. They can actually turn on their, their laptop or the computer or whatever and participate in something that has value to them. And I think that's amazing. Thank you for bringing that up. You know, the uh, Credible Theater Project in the spring, we were meant to tour our show, uh, which was called Box for Convenience. We ended up doing it in September online. Um, and that was a form theater play that was actually addressing the stigma attached to PTSD and, and OCD and folks living with, with OCD and PTSD. Um, in the spring, we decided not to put that online because participants in the group were feeling like it wasn't, it wasn't the right time anymore. They were feeling so much from the pandemic and, uh, we decided to create a new show that was addressing mental health during the time of COVID-19 and it was called Together Apart. And this show invited our participants to just share monologues or rants or ideas, tableaus which are frozen pictures with their bodies, um, their experiences of, of isolation and, and fear and hope during this time and something that really came up for our group was they were saying, they were telling the audience, they were saying, welcome to our world. Folks who have a hard time leaving their home mm. because of anxiety, mm. fear yeah. of the unknown, folks who, who struggle with depression, can't get out of bed. And they were feeling like, you know, the fact that we could meet together online was, as you're saying, was creating more access, was creating the kind of solidarity that they wished we had all the time. Yeah. And so it actually, for that project specifically, and, and I think for others, uh, much like I, I shared with the idea of performances going forward, I, I feel like for projects, working with participants, a lot of whom, you know, are 
um, you know, are struggling with either mental health or perhaps uh, elders who aren't able to leave their homes or folks struggling with uh, language barriers, whatever the, the focus of our group that's bringing us together, having opportunities for different modes of participation has always been something that I, I try to provide and Branch Up Theatre really strives to offer. And I think creating opportunities to join online as well as in person offers that to folks who that might be a better option for you know, going forward beyond the pandemic. So uh, it's, yeah, it's created another layer of, of opportunity for, who, for, for for different folks. It has. And Naomi, uh, like you said, it's, um, it's work that you're doing that is inclusive. You're including everybody, everybody who has gone through stuff, who's going through stuff. And uh, you talked about post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. You've talked about obsessive compulsive disorder. You've talked about people who were dealing with mental illness, people who were just trying to find their voice. We want to be as inclusive as possible. And that's what the work that you're doing. And by doing this uh, virtually, that's exactly what you're doing. You're including another group of people to participate in something that they otherwise never would have had. So as bad as this pandemic has been and continues to be, there are certain things that we all have to look at and say, you know what, if it hadn't have been for this, this would not have happened. And I think if we can look for the positive things from the COVID experience, and there are many, then we are going to all cope with it much, much better. And I don't see us being physically distanced forever. That's not been the way this world has worked. There's been pandemics before, there have been uh, outbreaks before, and we've all survived it. We're all going to survive this. So thank you for uh, mentioning that because I think that's a really important thing. The inclusion of people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get on. What are you working on now that you can share with us? Sure. Uh, so as I shared, I'm currently working with the seniors in Toronto. We are we are figuring out what we want to touch upon in our play that we're working on, which is addressing elder abuse and looking at themes of isolation. So we're working on figuring out the fine tuning details of that show. Um, and I, myself, uh, as a playwright, have been sitting on a play for a really long time. Oh, really? And yes, I've been sitting on this play for a really long time. And, and it's uh, I'm taking the time to actually work on it. And, and uh, my hope is to give it the time and space that it, it needs. Um, yeah. And then uh, I have this new vision. So I'm excited to share and plant the seeds here. Let's do it. As you know, as an artist, as a facilitator, as someone who has a spiritual practice of meditation and uh, and doing some you know visualization work, I I am excited to merge those worlds together and offer something in the new year called Creative Cave, and it's going to be online and it's going to be an invitation for folks whether they've ever had a creative practice or not, whether they consider themselves an artist or not, it is open. It's an invitation to find that inner artist, to mm. create space for creativity. Because I believe that when we can tap into our creativity, our intuition, and have it as a, a regular practice, a discipline, that can plant seeds of so much joy and growth in so many other areas of our life. When we, when we really motivate ourselves to create space for a creative practice, mm -hmm. then we are uncovering so many new seedlings that may have been dormant or that may have been ignored or that may have been put down by somebody in our life recently or a long time ago. And it, it won't necessarily be a goal-oriented space. It's going to be open. It's an invitation to just see what wants to come through and to just have a practice of being creative, being mindful, being in a community where there's celebration of 
of creative practice mm -hmm. and encouragement and a lot of uh, a lot of openness to see what wants to be explored. So that's those, those are the seeds that I'm planting for the new year. Well, right? that is a great project to be developing, and I'm excited to see it actually have a start and to see where it goes because it has so much potential. And you are absolutely right. What a great way to get people to really go deep into themselves, be creative and experiencing experience new things. It, I, I totally agree with you that acting, writing, all these creative things that we can do, uh, playing an instrument or whatever, it just opens up just different channels in our brain and brings us a lot of joy in the things that we do. So I'm excited to see that take, take off for you. Uh, you. You've come a long way from that five-year-old shy Naomi <laughs> that used to hide behind her mom's leg, right? I believe so. Yeah. Now, I would imagine that with everyone that you've seen and all the work that you've done, you've probably seen some five-year-olds or, or some other kids who were just like Naomi way back when, who have come out of their shell as well. Can you think of, or can you share any of those stories with us uh, where you saw transformation? Because role play is so powerful. The more we do it, the more confidence we build. And that's in every aspect of our life, you know, like you can role play in front of a mirror, you know, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that you're doing the work. So all the work that you have done with all your participants, are there a couple of stories that stick out in your mind as being, yes, so that was a success, you know, that kind of thing? Definitely. I, I think of <laughs> whether it's just been a, a short public workshop I've done and I've had a participant who, as I explained earlier, has come and, and said, I'm here to watch. You know, I, <laughs> I just want to, you know, I'll, I'm going to sit in and, and see what happens. Or maybe it's been, you know, a, a workplace workshop that I've done. And there's a similar resistance of, you know, I'm here because I have to be here and I'm just going to watch. And I love it when there's a moment of transformation in those folks who've come with so much resistance and they see this infectious laughter spreading amongst participants and we're playing different games and, and getting into our bodies and our voices and just being creative together, that they can't help but getting enticed and being called forth to join in. Well, I wonder how they're getting that idea. Could there be somebody who might be asking them to do that at the very beginning? I'm not, I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing here, Naomi. Well, that's it. I, I put the invitation out there, right? And I, <laughs> as I mentioned before, you know, I like to create a safe container and invite folks to participate as they feel most able and comfortable. And there's always the right to pass. I always put that in, in all the workshops and the projects that I lead. There's always a right to pass, which I think is a really powerful opportunity too because sometimes in life we don't we don't feel like we have that opportunity right so mm. so that's because there is all that choice when folks who have been resistant suddenly join in and suddenly take the stage or take you know take space in in a workshop setting and they find their their voice they get involved to me, those are the those are the moments that I that I cherish, and it feels like okay, I I I am so grateful to have been part of that journey with someone. Uh, and when I think about a project participant, that really stands out to me in terms of their journey of of transformation. Uh, I was running a youth project in partnership with the Canadian Center for Gender and Sexual Diversity known as CCGSD a long time ago. And uh, uh, maybe not a long time ago, but some years ago. And we were working with LGBTQ youth and allies, and we were creating plays addressing homophobia and transphobia. And there was a participant who wanted to be part of the project and came every session, but made it really clear that they didn't want to be in the play. They wanted to contribute to the play, their ideas, and they were even happy to help with writing the script, but they didn't want to be on stage. They didn't feel comfortable being seen. Mm -hmm. And that was totally fine. And they were able to you know, even help with some ideas for directing. And there's always a role for everybody 
in each of the projects and always space for folks to choose what feels best for them to express themselves. So this participant went from, you know, putting that out there, their preferences to when we started rehearsing, <laughs> they decided that they were comfortable playing a part that wouldn't be seen. Ah. So they got to be a character whose voice was heard from off stage. Oh, cool. And then they got to be a character whose voice was heard from behind a set piece on the stage. And then when we did the performance, this participant came in front of the audience and spoke their truth. Uh. After the play, when the audience was asking questions and sharing their experiences and what they got from the play, this person just blossomed and just owned what the play was about and talked about their lived experience, which wasn't a requirement, but they, they, they voiced what they experienced at school and their principal and vice principal were watching. Oh. And it was such a powerful shift. You know, they had the agency every step of the way to choose how they wanted to participate. And then they got to that place where they, they were able to stand front and center and fully stand uh, in their shoes, confident and supported by the rest of the group to fully be, to fully be in that, that place of, uh, yeah, of speaking, of speaking you, out. Wow, what a powerful story that is. It gave me goosebumps, I, I, I gotta tell you. Well, I'm not surprised though, because you are giving them a safe environment to participate if they choose to, and to remain silent if they choose to as well. But the encouragement that you provide them and that everybody else does, provides them the, a support and a safety net that you know some people are kind of like, you know, is it safe to go through that door? Well, they say it is, but I don't know, I'm kind of okay here. And then, well, everybody seems to be having a good time and this seems to be going well. You know, maybe I'll take a step a little closer to it until they walk through the door and then they are empowered. They get to stand in front of an audience and just be themselves. And, and what a great feeling that must have been for you and for everyone else to experience is that, wow, this transformation you know, this wow. cater caterpillar into a butterfly, you know? It was amazing. And then I, maybe it was six months or a year later, I led a training and it was for LGBTQ youth, again, who were in high school and this, this participant had graduated and came from their high school. And they were so vocal and active in the <laughs> whole training. It was, it was that next level of transformation. And I was so grateful that I got to work with them again to, to witness that next step in, in their life and how they were translating that into their participation in the work we were doing together. How wonderful. Your work has been uh, so, um, right word I'm looking for, transforma uh, transformative for people. That's, you know, you've transformed people. You've uh, given people the permission to use their voice or to address the issues by role playing, by discussing, and by involving a community in what you were doing. Because you're not just doing it for a few people, you're involving everybody who's bought a ticket or everybody who's joined to see this thing. You're involving the community to uplift the individual. And I think that is remarkable work. And I have to applaud you and your production company, whoever's participating with you. That is, that, that's so beautiful to hear. Uh, a lot of us don't, we don't realize what, what other people are doing out there to support people who need support. And we all need support right now, but your work is fantastic. You've touched on a few things that I want to um, kind of end up with. You said uh, at one point, there's more than one way to transform a conflict. And I thought that was a very powerful statement to make because you are absolutely right. And you're an example of that one way of transforming conflict and giving people a voice. You said as well, and I love this, uh, you were giving people a safe right to pass. 
and you don't have to feel obligated to do anything. We're just happy to have you here. And wow, that's, uh, uh, God, that's um, such a nice uh, statement to make. So I'm getting kind of, um, I'm really, <laughs> really enjoying what you're doing. So I, um, can you leave us with a few thoughts and ideas on how others can maybe find you, join you, um, do something on their own because a lot of people out there just need it. Mm, thank you so much for all you've shared. I'm, ah, I'm feeling moved and touched to, to be sharing with you and to, to be reflected back and, and heard and seen. So thank you so much. Thank you. So to find uh, the work that I'm leading that Branch Out Theatre is offering in the world, please visit www.branchouttheatre.com. And uh, we have a newsletter that we send out with upcoming workshops, trainings, and performances. We actually have an upcoming performance on December 6th as part of the Playback North America Unconference. And it's actually addressing, it's called Transforming Stigma, sharing stories around mental health and community care. And uh, that will be available to uh, to join through our website and our Facebook page um, and to leave with uh, some ideas of what folks what you can do uh, yourself wherever you are I invite you to step outside wherever you are in nature and make a connection with a tree with the flower, with the rock, and take in some inspiration. And whatever inspiration you take in, this is a starting place. Maybe you want to write about it. Maybe you want to create a poem about it. Maybe there's a dance that wants to come through you. <laughs> Maybe it reminds you, whatever the inspiration that you receive from nature, maybe it reminds you of a book or an old play or a song, whatever it is connecting with nature and then connecting with a creative source. So putting those pieces together, it's something that I'm, I'm finding is really grounding right now during the pandemic to get outside. And if you can't get outside, if you can find a window and look outside, that's what I do with the seniors that I work with. If they can't get outside, we look outside and we describe to each other what we see out our windows. And then sometimes we start moving as the wind and just that gentle connection to nature and that connection to our bodies uh, or to our voices or to our creative expression, however it wants to show up. I love that. Layers of connection. Yeah, yeah. And that's so important too. I know um, here in Toronto, we have uh, a park, High Park, and uh, I, I'm sure that you're familiar with it, but some of our listeners may not be. But it's this huge park in the middle of uh, this uh, Toronto city. Uh, and it's so beautiful. And I was there just a couple of weeks ago. And just being, as you said, out in nature and, you know, looking at its beauty and feeling the air around you, it really uh, lifts your spirits up. You can't help but feel better to be out in the sunshine, even if it's the rain. There's a sound to the rain. There's whatever. But nature and beauty is what we really need to hold on to. One of the things that we need, to, uh, many things that we need to hold on to right now. So that's fantastic. And I'm going to ask you if uh, you can email me uh, the December uh, 6th link to where people might be able to get their tickets. If this show doesn't go on before December 6th, I can certainly post it on the website and oh, encourage you. people to check you out because you're doing such remarkable work. And I... I'm uh, in awe uh, of um, all the transformations that you're doing. And, and uh, thank you so much for what you guys are, are doing out there. It's amazing. And uh, any parting thoughts, any uh, words of inspiration other than what you've already graced us with? Hmm. You do a lot of uh, meditation and Reiki and, and, uh, and that. So is there something that, uh, that you've experienced from that that maybe people can use a little bit? right now yeah ah something that i've been trying to really embrace right now is just to honor honor what's coming up not to push it away 
right? So when there, when there are feelings, when there are, when there are memories, challenging thoughts that are coming through, to allow yourself to be with them and to really offer yourself the compassion that you deserve mm. to, to move through whatever it is you're moving through at the moment, which is why I said, get out in nature, That's make a creative it. connection, right? So that when, when there's stuff stirring within us, we know that we can get out and move with it. We can does not, not throw it away because it's there. It's, it's there as a teaching. It's an invitation to learn and to grow. Uh, and, and yet when we can be, when we can be with it and find a way to, to honor it and move with it and then transform it, mm-hmm. we have helped bring ourselves to that next stage of awareness, next stage of our own personal transformation. Because I do believe that the work has to start within. I, I always uh, say peace starts here. As I bang the drum of my heart, peace starts here. Transformation starts here. Whatever it is we are, we are trying to put out in the world, it starts within ourselves. So, so just starting with ourselves, trusting that when we take the time to honor ourselves compassionately, love ourselves, and give ourselves a space and time for grief, for healing, for feeling what we're feeling and nurturing all that is coming through, then we can grow and transform to where we want to be in our lives. I like that. Uh, so many things that you've said have really resonated with me, and I'm sure that it has with my listeners. You've touched on a lot of things. And throughout this podcast, uh, many of the messages has been to uh, express yourself and to reach out to people and to you know feel safe and to, if you're not feeling safe, to surround yourself by people that, that will make you feel safe. And that's, those are messages that we all need during these times. And again, I said these times, anytime, but especially now because people are going through so much. So for all the listeners out there, Naomi has her uh, branch out theater, her workshops and everything that can help you find your voice if you need to find your voice or to express how you're feeling when you need to express that. And Naomi is a great guide to give you that. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show here uh, today, Naomi. Uh, You've shared a lot of great things with us and I applaud the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another insightful episode. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and leave your comments. For more information, check out our website at www.inspireus.ca. Remember, it's not what happens to us that matters most. It's how we respond to what happens to us that does. Stay strong and resilient.